There are so many voices in this country that are speaking up and active, people active in their communities, that I'm not talking about a fringe minority or a silent majority, but the silenced majority, silenced by the mainstream media. The media today represents a minority elite. These all have to be challenged, and many people are doing it. It's Michael Franti here. This is Amy Goodman with Rochester. Rochester Indie Media. Hi, you're watching Indie TV. I'm Dawn, the Barefoot host. And today's topic is something a lot of us don't talk about, we don't often like to think about, and we're taking the time to talk and think about it in a way we often don't hear about. And we're talking about the home death movement, keeping loved ones at home after they have passed, and green cemeteries, and allowing a body to naturally decompose in the earth. And here in our studio today to do that with us is Lynn Barnett, who coordinates the local Rochester uh, Home Funeral Resources. And we also have Fr Francis Geraldo, whose husband passed March 1st of 2008. And Frances is going to share her experience. And these are also friends of mine from the community at large. And I'm just very excited that you guys were able to come here and be so open and giving with your um, you know, feelings and experience about this. So, so thank you. You're welcome. And welcome. <laughs> so let's start with um, just setting up what is a home funeral and I think the main thing we want to convey during the show is there are choices and this is often something we don't hear about so what is the idea of a home funeral? Lynn. Uh, the idea is basically to be as involved in the process as is possible um, which has many many benefits um, but it's basically keeping the body home after a person has died um, or even bringing a body back from the hospital if someone has died in the hospital or a, 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 um, a hospice care home mm -hmm. as well. And how did you get involved with this? I got a couple of, friend of friends of mine were interested a couple years ago and we started meeting really. We met for a couple years and talked about this and wanted to make it possible to to have this available as a resource in Rochester and so a couple of years I think it was about two years ago, a friend uh, of mine, and I went to a workshop in Connecticut with a, a woman who does a lot of home funerals in California. Mm -hmm. And now Francis, and we have this beautiful altar here. We're going to have Francis describe it later, but it has pictures of Alex, uh, your husband's home funeral, which are beautiful and colorful. And we have tissues, and I'm going to take one now because uh, <laughs> Francis was telling us about meeting her husband, and he was a sound guy on the Jerry Lake show. We just found this out. Ricky couple, Lake. Oh, Ricky Lake? Sorry, yeah. I don't watch TV. <laughs> uh, get off the couch and go out and play, kids. That's what my mother always told me. But um, so uh, just the spirit of him, you know, wanting to be in the studio and doing video work is really interesting. But tell me as far as um, your connection coming into the home funeral and how you made this decision for Alex. So maybe you could take us a little, you know, back to the beginning of Alex became sick and you have to make some choices. Well, Alex actually, the decision to have a home funeral was his and I supported that. I mean, we homeschool and the last child that we had was born at home and so it kind of just seemed to fit with how we live and and he, we had been good friends with Lynn um, and so he was working with Lynn about making plans for that. Mm -hmm. And so he and how did you feel when he came to you and said, this is what he wants? I supported him on that. I, you know, I wanted it too, but he needed to make that decision for himself, I felt, and I supported him in that. And so he, came, he met with you, Lynn? Yeah, we met several times, and there, was, uh, there were a lot of questions that I had um, that we talked about together. Um, things from really wanting a home funeral um, in general to kind of what shirt he might want to wear. I mean, and um, 
Hmm. So we met several times and talked about and a lot are of things. And would you call yourself, there's a term called the death midwife? Now what does this mean? <laughs> this is like something going around. It's really, there, there is a woman that, there's in California that I spoke about before. She is termed a death midwife. Um, I, I suppose you could call me that. I don't know, really. I just feel like I want to help people help facilitate this, help people know that this is a possibility. And really that's what actually the woman, the, the workshop allowed me to do was to have the confidence to do it, that you can just do it. Anybody can really do it um, mm -hmm. with a little bit of information. So how is this um, experience, because you two are close friends, first you were friends, you didn't just go looking for Lynn for, uh, under these circumstances. So you were lucky to have known her. Mm -hmm. What if somebody doesn't know where to go or that they even can do that. Some people think it's elite, like we have to be embalmed, we have to go to a funeral director. So how do we, you know, get information out to people and let them know that you know where to tap in and find choices around this? Well, there are a couple of websites that you can um, look for. We don't have a website right now in Rochester, but um, I'm hoping to do that relatively soon. And um, but there's a woman, Jerry Grace Lyons, who has an organization called Final Passages, and that's a place where you can find out general information about home funerals. Also, there's a woman, Beth Knox, who has a uh, an organization called Crossings um, down in Maryland. Um, but people can contact me if they in the area if they wanted some more information about this locally. <clears throat> and you have children. How many children do you have? I have three children. And their ages? Uh, the oldest is 10. His name is Sam. And the middle one is Kiara. And she's about to turn seven in September. And our youngest was is Isabella. And we call her Izzy. She's four. And so Alex, um, he had cancer, correct? Mm -hmm. And when he finally, what, did he pass at home? Did he actually die at home He as actually well? died at home, And yes. then you just kept him at home. How was that process? What did it how did it actually play out and how did the children react to that? It was a really grueling process, but he, he chose to do macrobiotic diet. He didn't do conventional treatment, although he did do radiation. He had stage four lung cancer when he, and um, he had some tumors in his brain. So he did have radiation, but besides that, he didn't do a typical chemo or anything. He was doing it through diet and there was a woman who was helping him. So actually the last uh, almost two months, he was staying with someone who was cooking for him because the diet was so intense. So he actually came home for almost two weeks and that's when he was really failing and um, actually the community, the whole homeschool community were the people that really just just came in and it was such a beautiful experience of everybody just coming together to care for him and um, and he didn't quite make it for two full weeks. He was almost going to be going into a hospice mm -hmm. facility because he was just failing so quickly. And he, so you did not use hospice at all then? To we did, but they just didn't seem to be working out for us. And I just had so much other support from the homeschool community that it was no comparison. I needed really more help than they were able to provide at that time. Well, there's a lot of fear. We're going to talk about this when we come back because with you know this wanting to hide this process, I think, from ourselves and from our children, it seems very scary. So we try to push it as soon as somebody passes, get it out of the way, and just move on with life. And so we want to talk about how people react seeing you know their their father, in your case, or someone they love in their home for a few days as they grieve in this process. And so we'll talk more about the grieving process and more about the legalities when we come back. We're going to take a break. Rochester Indie Media, Rochester Indie Media, Indie TV. Stay tuned. I'm good. I'm fine. Coming in? People are saying, oh my gosh, I've got a dead body. I've got to get him out of the house, like now, you know. If you're keeping the body at home, turn on an air conditioner, turn off the heat, get dry ice. I love seeing families walk through that doorway, the doorway of fear. Ashes to ashes. Some people refer yes, to me yes. as a death midwife. I sometimes call myself a home funeral guide. It is legal in nearly all states to care for your own dead. It's far more simple than people think. If stores started charging $10 for a tomato, you'd go out and grow your own tomatoes. That's beginning to happen now with funerals. Rochester Indie TV, today's topic is home funerals and green funerals, and today in the studio we have Lynn Barnett and Francis Geraldo. Uh, Lynn is an advocate around home 
funerals and a resource here in Rochester. And Frances's husband passed in March of 2008, and she's sharing her experience. And we were talking about um, Alex having died at home and then leaving his body at home to grieve and go through the mourning process before his burial. So how does that happen? I mean, first, I just want to know the logistics. Um, you know, people feel that the body decomposes very quickly and has to be embalmed. So I, I imagine this doesn't, it's not happening at a home funeral. So it what happens? It, it, embalming doesn't need to happen. It's not required by law. Um, but what, if you're going to keep a body home for any length of time, we kept Alex home for three days. Uh, you, there, you would like, you, you want to keep the body cool to, you know, resist the, the decomposition. I mean, it's not really going to start, but things could start, could start smelling or, uh, you know. Um, How do you do that? So we use dry ice. We use dry ice, and that's um, kind of one of the things that we got from the the class that we went to in Connecticut. But um, really, just put um, a few packs of dry ice under his body and change them when we needed to, and it was. And what if, yeah, you, so you just would change, I mean, and you could clean his body, and do family members want to do that, or do you want to try to get someone, you know, to help with that, or how is that for you, Francis? Well, there was a circle of, of um, women, actually, and Lynn included, that were going to do that, and I was thinking that I was going to be wanting to do that, and um, Alex, I think, had actually requested who might be there to do that. Um, but once he passed, that's that kind of just all unfolded, and uh, I actually didn't end up being part of that. But he was in just such wonderful hands, and because I was up dealing with being with my daughter, and and how did the kids respond to the loss of their father? Oh, and to seeing him at home. My this my time. middle daughter just cried a lot, and uh, you know, just I just tried to console her, and we sat upstairs until she was ready to come down, and then when she wanted to come down, she just wanted to come down by herself. And I knew that my good friends were down there taking care of Alex, so I had to let her go and do it the way she wanted to do it. And my son didn't want to participate in anything. And this was part of the beauty of the home funeral, because he wasn't able to. He actually went out with Lynn's husband for the day because he just didn't want to be around. And that just ended up being perfect, because he just wasn't ready for it. And he, when he was ready, he came back, and it was available for him. So I mean, it was just really a wonderful thing. So you don't feel that they were forced to see something that no. they couldn't handle, or they were too young to absorb this and to be confronted with the reality of death that we don't often talk about? I don't believe in shielding them from the natural process. I just felt it seemed so natural the way everything happened and, and and unfolded. And the way he passed was actually very peaceful. Obviously, a lot of other things could have happened, but you know, he was at home. He was at risk for many different things happening, like seizures because of what his illness was. But you know, it just it seemed to be such a natural process. I would think it would be. Um very cathartic to have a body at home because then you could be angry, you could scream, you could cry, you could hug, you could kiss more, but do you really do all those things? Is that how it looked for you in that process? Yes, it did. I mean, I liked the fact that when I would go to bed at night, I could kiss Alex goodnight and that he was down there. And my son, actually, that couldn't be around him at first um, when he came home late at night, woke me up in the middle of the night and said, you know, I just went downstairs and saw daddy, you know, and I, and he was actually sick from it. But then he, and he came and got me and said, and now I feel better, you know, and he was able to do that. And where if he, we weren't at home, he wouldn't have had that opportunity. And he was able to do that when he was ready in his own time. <laughs> You know, this is this is particularly touching. I, my grandmother, she died at home, and it was very beautiful. But after, and we were around her bed, and we had this very beautiful, um, you know, home dying experience. But then, as soon as she had passed after the prayer, it was like some strange guys came up and they whisked her away. And I always felt like it wasn't, it was so quick, and that there wasn't some extra time, and that maybe she wouldn't have been quite wherever she was, mm -hmm. you know, or something was just too fast. So it just sounds very beautiful and very gentle and very respectful, I think, in the process. And, and it's very different. And not to say that, the, you know, often there's a lot of profit making that goes on in the regular home funeral. You have to pick a casket and you have to do all that. Did you have to make choices like that where you had to buy things and do things and, and spend a lot of money to get a funeral together? No. At all? No. I mean, we did have things prepared or Lynn had thought of things. I mean, he was buried in a pine box and that was also part of such a beautiful process as and you can see everybody the children and I were the first ones, got a chance to decorate it however we wanted. And then our community just, you know, we opened that up to everybody. And so it was just such a beautiful experience. His casket was colored and, you know, just 
what, any, what anybody felt like doing. Obviously, there were some rules about what you could or couldn't put on it to be in the Green Cemetery. But. So why don't we just quickly mention the Green Cemetery and what, um, this is in Ithaca where Alex is finally resting now and there's, uh, it's only four unembalmed, like all natural bodies to, to rest, is that it? It's in Newfield, Green Springs, is that it? Um, it's, Springs. it's south of Ithaca. South. Um, at the town, but okay. And um, what are the requirements, and what does that mean, like Green Cemetery? What's the benefit of that? Um, basically, it's it's m the decomposition process is much quicker, and there's really the idea is to go back into the natural state as quickly as possible. So you can go in a pine box, um, you can go in just a shroud, um, you can be buried in a shroud. You, th as you said, you can't be embalmed. You can't have a metal casket. There's no concrete liner, which most people don't know. That's something standard in most, if not all, of cemeteries um, uh, around. So, so it's earth-friendly. I mean, really, oh, yeah. it's very um, gentle on the earth and on the process. I saw that film, um, A Family Undertaking, a family undertaking mm -hmm. which was a special done on PBS a while back, yep. and they looked at the film, followed some uh, home funerals, and just how gentle this process is on the family and the body, sometimes compared to the you know, draining, and then they have to puncture mm -hmm. some organ. I mean, it's not, I mean, again, not to scare people that if you can't make this choice, that this is the only choice that's loving. Because I mean, there are reasons people make these other choices, but that we don't often realize we have this choice, and it is, um, it just, it, it seems just all around like a more gentle process. So we're going to take a break right now. We have. Um, these public access shows for Indie TV every Monday at 6.30 and Thursday at 8.30. And you can also find us on the internet at rochester.indymedia.org. You can read about other things happening in Rochester and you can plug in. You can get involved with our shows. You can write an article on our website and we'd like you involved. So please contact us and let us know what's on your mind. Pitch us a show idea. Come and talk to us because we want to know what's, what the community's thinking. So again, this is Dawn with Rochester Indie TV, and today we're talking about the home funeral movement. Stay tuned. We've institutionalized the most important rites of passage in our culture, birth and death, and we've become very separated from those passages, which has then caused this huge gap of knowledge, and we're always afraid of the unknown. If you would indeed behold the spirit of death, open your heart wide unto the body of life. For life and death are one, even as the river and the sea are one. What we don't know, what we haven't seen, looms out there like the big demon. And once we've seen it, once we've touched the body of our loved one, it's not scary anymore. What I call a home funeral is where the family is involved in creating and carrying out all the funeral arrangements. And it doesn't usually involve a funeral home or a mortuary at all. So beat the drum slowly and play. Ashes to ashes. Yep. I'm a young cowboy. I feel the home death movement is just an idea whose time has come. If you have a baby in a hospital, you have a birth plan. Otherwise, you get intimidated by the system. So, same thing on the other end of life. What's the death plan going to be, you know? In the 1900s, everybody took care of their loved ones. We died at home, generally. Family took care of us. We were laid out in the parlor. And then they would build the casket, or maybe in the general store. You could just go in and buy one. And then you dig a hole out on the back 40 and have a little cemetery on your property. This was just done as a matter of course in the families. And everyone knew what to do, just as they knew what to do when a baby was expected. Caring for our own changed somewhat actually around the time of the Civil War because soldiers would die on the battlefield and then families would want them sent home for burial. And that's when the practice of embalming first began to take place. 
And then came the undertakers, and they undertook to take care of this for us. And with time, that just became how families started dealing with it. Come and make a tour of inspection with us. First of the featured reposing rooms is this, the Williamsburg Room, equipped for music and establishing the general pattern for all the rooms in its authenticity of style and atmosphere of quiet dignity. In marked contrast is the Provincial Room, lovely and authentic reproductions of French provincial pieces like this period secretary containing exquisite porcelain figurines. Truly different is the Smoking Lounge. This modern room needs comfort and relaxation. I think the main thing with regard to the funeral home is that it's a professional institution and it doesn't lend itself to intimacy. These people, it doesn't matter how good they are at their job, they're just a professional and they're a stranger. And this is someone, whoever it is we've lost in a family, we loved them and no one can treat them as tenderly as you know, no matter how good or how professional they are, as someone who loved them. You're watching Rochester Indie TV, and I'm John, the Barefoot host, but I'm not the only one barefoot today. We have Lynn and Francis, also barefoot, and it's uh, very apropos because we're talking about um, things that we've reclaimed and that we're doing ourselves, like home funerals and taking things out of the hands of the experts, like birthing our children and homeschooling and the home funeral movement. And so there's something very natural about us not having shoes as well. And it feels comfortable too, because this carpet's not all bad. But uh, we're gonna talk to um, Francis now about how this process has been post Alex passing. I mean, now you're very young. Alex was very young. This is something people don't often prepare for in life. How, how, how are you doing now? How are you, you know, is the same community that was there for your home funeral still supporting you? And it just doesn't stop after this? And, and where do you go now? It hasn't stopped. Um, it's definitely slowed down um, a little bit in the sense of, you know, my, my home was so a bustle with people when he was at home and then when he passed and a lot of phone calls right after and things have kind of quieted down a little bit. But we definitely feel the support of our community in a big way and, um, and really the whole experience of someone being ill and going through this whole process, if there's anything that's really come to me, is just being in the moment. So I, that's where I am right now. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what this has brought for me in a big way of living and experiencing and being here right now and mm -hmm. not, you know, so much trying. Like a lot of people will say to me, so what are you going to do now? And, um, you know, I'm just trying to be in today. And it was, a, you know, a really long process to go through and very emotionally, you know, just emotionally, you know, draining mm -hmm. and but really positive in a lot of ways. So right now I just really feel like I'm just trying to be with the um, everything that's kind of just settled, you know. It's been such an intense process. Mm -hmm. well, then do you see a difference? Now Frances had um, a lot of time, at least knowing her husband was dying and he had to make these choices for himself. What about people who haven't really prepared this and thought about this before, but now they're faced with an immediate, you know, death um, really unexpectedly? How how is this difference? Is this something only for people who've had a lot of time to really think it out, or can it work the other way? No, it can work for anyone, really, you know, knowing, like I said before, just having the confidence that you can do it and knowing a few things, like the dry ice and, and um, I don't know, you know, um, a what funeral What if it's a car accident and the body is, you know, more... Well, that's, you know, it's certainly up to... Um, people to do. I think there are all sorts of things that you can do. You could work with a funeral home, maybe have them even make up the body or and have them and bring the body home. I, there are all different ways that you can do it. There's not just someone dying at home and keeping the body at home. So. And do you think this movement in general is changing the, the dialogue around death, that people are thinking about it more, preparing more? I mean, how widespread is this? How common is this right now? Um, I, I, yeah, you know, it hasn't been, the woman in, in California has been doing it for about 10 years, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, then people did it. We kind of skipped a generation where people used to do this. People used to lay out their friends and loved ones and family in their homes. So um, um, it's not as common now, and not everybody is going to want to do it, but um, it's something that I want to let people to know that it's a possibility. And it wasn't hard, and it was, it was easier than I thought. 
and <laughs> the reward was incredible. I mean, for everyone who was there, the you know the family, their family, friends. Um, people that came in and were so moved and it was a very small if you think you have to have a separate room and a, a big place to have this that's not true either they lived in a very small apartment and he was in laid out in the living room so people when they came in there was kind of the kitchen the living room upstairs a lot of kids were playing upstairs and or in the basement um, but it's anything is possible really um, and you know even keeping the body at home for a day or a few hours if someone dies at home we don't you know, you don't need to have the body taken right away, even if you don't have dry ice and don't want to do the whole process of keeping mm -hmm. them home until they're they're buried or cremated. Mm -hmm. And for you, Francis, I mean, would you recommend this then to people? Like, how are you talking about this experience? This to oh, others? I just, yeah, I'm so grateful for it. I mean, it, I, I just wanted to also say that even though Alex had spoken to Lynn about it, there wasn't like preparation. Like I didn't know, I never even had seen the family undertaking. I purposefully didn't really ask Lynn so many questions just because just that's how I am. I wanted to just see how it was gonna unfold and experience it. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of amazing as things just kind of showed up and things just came together for it. So there wasn't really a lot of like preparation. I didn't have things written out like this is gonna happen this way or that way. But we did kind of know who, you know, the logistics a little bit, but it really, I guess just being open to the experience was such a wonderful thing. I, I really didn't know how it was going to actually happen, you mm -hmm. know. I'm not a, a big planner <laughs> mm -hmm. as far as that goes, but, you know, I just um, recommend being open to the possibility of it because it was such a healing experience. And I asked my children, they knew we were doing the show today, and um, I asked them what would they want to say about their experience and they actually said that it was fun you know as hard as it was it was actually fun I mean mm -hmm. well you can so. see all the creativity with these photos which we'll be showing um, closer later maybe we could just show this altar but um, just the colors and the love and the creativity that went in you know to the details and the caring I mean, it just seemed like I could see why a child would think that that's a nice last rite of passage for a parent instead of something cold and scary and abstract mm -hmm. it's very it's very hands-on. And what else do you have here that, uh, was there other things on this altar that were particularly something about Alex that brings a story to mind or something you want to say about Alex? Mm. There's just some special things that we had. I had bought him the, he, this is a healing Buddha. I had bought him that for this past Christmas. And he used to like to have an altar set up at home. So these were his prayer beads and a cross that someone had made and some sacred beads from another friend. So just some mm -hmm. things that people had mm -hmm. kind of given us. So. Well, thank you. Let me just shake your hands. I'd give you a hug, but it always messes up the sound on the mic. But thank you so much for coming here. And You're welcome. I'm going to take this opportunity because I want what Alex had. And I'm going to say it right now on air because I'm not organized. And so I need everyone to know this is like a gift to all my loved ones that mm -hmm. it's very easy. I do not want shoes. I do not want new clothes. I just want whatever, you know, I've worn pretty much like that week for five days in a row. That's fine. And I like colors. I want these beautiful silks and colors and I don't want chemicals and I just want to be in the ground and this is this message has been approved and endorsed by Dawn the Barefoot host so it's good as gold so go back to that I'll make it easy and you've been watching Rochester Indie TV and thank you Francis and thank you Lynn for coming and talking about this because we have to talk about this mm -hmm. they say there's two things we have to do death and taxes well you can avoid taxes we're going to talk about that but you cannot avoid death so thank you for listening Rochester Indie TV. Thanks. <laughs>